Okay, we left off talking about the different types of cells that you find in primary visual cortex and V1 and area V2, secondary visual cortex. We talked about the LGN cells as well and how they have that center surround configuration. But how do you get these strange response properties? How do you, how do you wire up these feature detectors that Hubel and Wiesel found in the cat's visual cortex? For example, how would you go from cells with the center surround kind of receptive fields, these antagonistic center surrounds, to the simple cells in V1 that prefer lines of a particular orientation or bars of a particular orientation. Let me show you. So in this example, you've got a monkey, let's say, looking at a vertical line on the screen. Now, all the input from the visual field is coming into the brain by way of the LGN cells which have these center surround configurations, these center surround receptive fields. So the whole visual field you could picture being sort of covered up by these receptive fields. These ones right here in the center are on center receptive fields. So the center is excitatory, the surround is inhibitory. And here you can see that vertical line that the monkey is looking at. And it's passing through the excitatory center of three LGN cells here. Those LGN cells send their axons to stellate cells in layer 4C of primary visual cortex. You could imagine those three cells then sending their output into a single cell. In this case, you've wired up a simple cortical cell that responds preferentially to vertical lines right here in this part of the visual field. You can also see that if you put a vertical line here, it would hit the inhibitory part of all three of these LGN cells. So this would be an inhibitory section on either side of the excitatory section. This particular cell would be sensitive to vertical lines, but you could imagine another simple cortical cell wired up to receive input from these three LGN cells. That cell would be wired up to detect horizontal lines in this location. You could also imagine the same thing for diagonal lines and so forth, and also lines of different orientations at different locations within the visual field. In that way, you've sort of wired up the visual system to have feature detectors for lines of any orientation at any spot in the visual field. You could then imagine complex cells, which have those larger receptive fields, but don't have specific excitatory or inhibitory regions. You could imagine those being built up from the responses of multiple simple cortical cells. So for example, if you had a simple cell that liked vertical lines here, another one that liked vertical lines here, and so forth, you could wire up their output to feed into a single complex cell that would then be sensitive to vertical lines anywhere in its larger receptive field. In this way, the visual system can build up more and more complex response properties from the outputs of feature detectors, cells with specific response properties, at the next lower level. Another important property of the visual cortex, and of cortex in general, is that cells tend to be grouped together in columns based on their response properties. So for example, in visual cortex, there are separate columns, separate chunks of cortex that responds either mostly to input from the right eye, input from the left eye, or they respond equally to both eyes. These are known as ocular dominance columns, columns that respond preferentially to one or both eyes. We also have columns that respond to lines or edges of a particular orientation. So we've seen that you've got cells that respond to lines or edges of a particular orientation. It turns out those cells are grouped together based on the orientation that they prefer. This is showing you an example. So here you've got a section of cortex. Now the cortex doesn't really look like this, as you know. Uh, this looks like monkey bread or something, but so this is an artist's representation. But the artist here has graphically represented the edges of individual cortical columns. But of course you can't see the edges of cortical columns. They're defined based on their physiology, based on their function, not by anatomical landmarks. At any rate, you can imagine taking a microelectrode and slowly cranking it in to the brain and recording 
the action potentials of neurons that you encounter along the way. So for example, here's the path of a microelectrode as it was being pushed into the brain. You can see that as the electrode penetrates the brain and it passes within this column, all the cells have the same orientation preference. So each of these lines here is a spot where the electrode encountered a neuron. And then the orientation of this line shows the orientation preference of the neuron that it encountered there. When they probed each of these neurons, they found that each and every one preferred the same orientation, which is what you find within a column. But notice that down here, as the electrode passes across columns, obliquely across the cortex, as it goes through different columns, it encounters cells with different orientation preferences. So the cells in this column here have an orientation preference that's almost horizontal. The ones in the next column over have almost a vertical orientation preference. You find the same thing with this penetration here. As the electrode penetrates, it encounters multiple orientation columns, each one with cells that prefer a different orientation. So Hubel and Wiesel noticed this, and they noticed that the orientation preference changed kind of gradually as they went from one cortical column to the next. What they didn't know was the big picture, which was only discovered later using an optical imaging technique that involves shining light of certain wavelengths at the cortical surface of monkeys' brains and measuring the light that bounces back, which is associated with the level of activity in each part of the cortex. This is showing you primary visual cortex in a macaque monkey, and it's color-coded to indicate the orientation preference of different patches of the visual cortex. So for example, wherever you see light blue, like this, the cells in that column prefer vertical lines. Wherever you see red, the cells in that column prefer horizontal lines. And you can see that all the orientations are represented throughout the primary visual cortex here. If you zoom in, though, you see something even more interesting. There are these points, these singularities. They're called pinwheels. And around each pinwheel, all of the orientation preferences are represented. So all 180 degrees are represented in a circle around this point. Same thing for this point, and this one, and this one. You'll also notice that the edges of one pinwheel merge into the edge of the next pinwheel. We still don't really understand what causes this remarkable organization, how it develops in the brain. But we know that it starts taking shape even before the animal is born, even before it's seen anything. Getting back to this idea of receptive fields, we mentioned that they become larger at each successive stage of visual processing. In addition, their response properties become more specialized. What they respond to becomes more specific and typically more complex at each successive stage of visual processing. By the time you get to inferior temporal cortex, you end up finding cells with very complex response properties and with very large receptive fields, often the size of the entire contralateral visual field. For example, right visual field if you're recording from a neuron in the left cortex. These inferior temporal cortex cells respond selectively to very complex shapes, but they're often insensitive to distinctions, subtle distinctions like orientation and size, that are critical to cells earlier on in visual processing. Here's just one example. Here are some face responsive cells in inferior temporal cortex. You can see cell A here responds well to faces. On the x-axis of this graph here is time, and what you're seeing is a histogram of the number of action potentials in little bins of time over the course of a short period. The gray area is the period when a picture was presented, the picture right below it. In this case, a line drawing of a monkey. Here you see a line drawing of a monkey with the features scrambled. It still has all the same face parts, but they're in the wrong configuration. And then here, this is supposed to represent two photographs of monkeys' faces as opposed to line drawings. Then a photograph of a human face and a photograph of a hand. You can see this cell responds pretty selectively to faces, not interested in body parts generally. And even a scrambled face doesn't work. So it's not that it's just responding to 
uh, individual elements or individual features, but rather the, the whole configuration of the face has to be correct. The cell you could think of as being kind of a feature detector for faces. This neuron here has an even more specific response property. You can see when the photograph of the monkey's face is looking directly at the monkey whose neuron is being recorded, the cell doesn't respond much at all. But as the face's orientation changes to be looking a little bit away from the observer, you can see the level of activity increase. And it has no interest in toilet brushes. So again, cells with very complex response properties. Shape constancy is the ability to recognize an object's shape despite sometimes dramatic changes in the size or the orientation of an object. I can recognize my friend from 5 feet away or from 50 feet away almost just as well. And it doesn't usually matter which direction my friend is facing. If they're facing directly toward me or off to one side or the other, I can usually recognize the shape of that person's face. This is an example of shape constancy. It's something like color constancy, which we talked about earlier, the ability to recognize color despite changes in lighting. And it's widely presumed that the ability of neurons in inferior temporal cortex to ignore changes in size and orientation is what contributes to our capacity for shape constancy. Many of the neurons here uh, don't seem to really care how big the object is or uh, what orientation it is, as long as that particular object is present in its receptive field. As we've also learned earlier, damage to the pattern pathways, in other words, the ventral stream within the visual cortex, can lead to deficits in object recognition. These deficits are generally described as visual agnosias. Visual agnosia is an inability to recognize objects despite an unimpaired ability to see generally. And again, it's caused mainly by damage to parts of the ventral stream in inferior temporal cortex, typically. But there are many versions of visual agnosia, many forms of it. One form of visual agnosia, a very specific form, is known as prosopagnosia. This is an inability to recognize faces, just faces. Sometimes it goes along with other forms of visual agnosia, but it can occur just by itself. It typically occurs after damage to the fusiform gyrus, which is on the ventral surface of the temporal lobes, down on the bottom of the brain. It's easy to imagine that these folks walk around looking at uh, blobs on the tops of people's necks as if they can't see faces at all. This isn't the case. It's not that they don't see that there's a face there or recognize it as a face. Their difficulty is in discriminating faces, being able to tell one face from another. However, they can often recognize their friends and family by other characteristics. For example, the clothes that they're wearing, the way they hold themselves, the way they speak, the sound of their voice, uh, the way they wear their hair. There are lots of cues, visual and otherwise, to people's identity that don't involve actually recognizing the features of their face. This video you're about to watch illustrates what happens when you directly stimulate this part of the brain, this face-sensitive area, in the fusiform gyrus. This is Nancy Canwesher, a professor at MIT who spent a good deal of her career studying what's known as the fusiform face area, a term that she gave to this area, which she first discovered using functional MRI in healthy humans. Functional MRI is wonderful in this kind of way that you can identify pieces of the brain, which I think also correspond to pieces of the mind. That's why I care. Um, and that's, that's a very fun enterprise. Um, but it has fundamental limitations, and one of the most important limitations is that it, you can't test the causal role of those regions. So even with all of this work, we don't know that if you lost that part of the brain, you would lose your face recognition ability, or that if you messed with that part of the brain, you would affect face recognition. Okay, so that's a very important question you can't answer with functional MRI, but you can answer it with other methods. So I'm going to show you a videotape from a paper that was published just a couple years ago uh, by a neurologist, Joseph Parvizi at Stanford, working with my former student, Kelly Grill Spector. And so they, they tested this man who's shown here in his hospital bed. Um, he has intractable epilepsy. 
So most people with epilepsy, the epilepsy can be treated with drugs that, that um, prevent or reduce seizures. Some people are not responsive to drugs. They have so many seizures that they just can't live a normal life. And in that situation, the main thing you can do is try to identify the focus of the seizure, where it's coming from, uh, and take it out surgically. And that's you know heavy duty neurosurgery. Nobody wants to have to do this, but if that's your only choice, that's what you do. So this guy has electrodes all around the surface of his brain, trying to map, out. he's in the hospital with these electrodes in, mapping out the location of his seizures so that when a seizure happens, they can see where it starts so they know what to do surgically. While he's sitting in the hospital room waiting for a seizure to happen, uh, some people in the situation are willing to let psychologists record data from their brain and run experiments on them. In this case, this guy was, was willing to have um, Parvizi and um, Girl Spector um, put in a small electrical current uh, in part of his brain to test what, it hap what happened when they did that. So they scanned this guy with functional MRI before his electrodes were placed in. They found his fusiform face area. They put the electrodes in. They then scanned anatomically, registered the data, and saw that two of the electrodes were right on top of the fusiform face area. Okay. So the question is, what happens when you stimulate the fusiform face area? And I'll show you. Just look at my face and tell me what happens when I do this. All right? One, two, three. Nothing. Nothing? Okay. I'm going to do it one more time. Look at my face. One, two, three. You just turned into somebody else. Tell me Your about face it. metamorphosed. Your nose got saggy, you went to the left. You almost looked like somebody I'd seen before, but somebody different. That was a trip. <laughs> okay. I think that nails it. Right? This is the this is the ideal experiment. This is the causal intervention. This is going in there and testing what happens when you intervene on that very specific part of the brain, identified separately with functional MRI, and what you see is it affects Okay, so that video I think shows a couple of important things. First, it shows that this part of the brain, the fusiform face area, has a causal role in face perception. Secondly, it shows you an important principle of science in general and neuroscience specifically, which is that you always need a control condition. And as much as possible, you want to control for everything you can, except for the one thing that you're trying to manipulate. In this case, what you were trying to manipulate was stimulation of that face area. Hopefully you noticed in the video that there was a sham stimulation. So they flipped a switch, the patient heard a sound, and presumably was expecting something to happen, but nothing did. And then they flipped a switch, made the same sound, and something did happen. That sham stimulation, or that sham condition, is a kind of control condition designed to prevent the subject's own expectations and other psychological factors from influencing his perception. Now let's talk a little bit about the cortical mechanisms of color vision. Uh, we've talked about what happens in the retina, but now let's move on to the cortex. It turns out that in areas V1 and V2 there are these clusters of neurons that respond selectively to color. They're known as blobs. They're, they're only in layers two and three within the cortex. And these blobs send their output through parts of V4 and then into the posterior part of the inferior temporal cortex. Now, this area of V4, it's typically referred to as HV4 or human V4 because area V4 was identified in monkeys. And in monkeys, it does play an important role in color processing. There seems to be an analogous area in the human brain that you can localize using functional MRI, but it's not clear if that area is V4 in humans. In other words, it's not clear if it's the fourth retinotopic map, which is where these names come from. There's some evidence to suggest that it may actually be the eighth retinotopic map within human visual cortex. At any rate, this color sensitive area uh, may be responsible for color constancy because in humans, damage to this area of the brain causes something called cerebral achromatopsia, also called cortical color blindness. 
unlike color vision deficiency that occurs as a result of a genetic mutation of the photopigment genes that we discussed earlier, this is due to damage to the cortex. The eyes are totally fine, all the photopigments are intact, but here the part of the hardware in the cortex that helps process color is damaged. When people first get this, they often report seeing the world very differently, and uh, they often won't eat because food looks very bland, and they have a difficult time perceiving any color at all. Over time, they'll often be able to recover some of their ability to perceive color, but they rarely get back their ability to perceive color despite changes in lighting. In other words, they never seem to get back color constancy. And that brings us to brain reading. So this was a study conducted by Nancy Canrisher, who you just saw in that video. She identified the fusiform face areas. She localized this area in a group of subjects and also localized the separate area called the parahippocampal place area, circled in red here, that seems to play a role in processing location information. It becomes active when people see scenes of places for example, buildings or the interiors of buildings. And here you can see the fusiform face area right on the fusiform gyrus. So she localized these areas, and then she had subjects either view pictures of famous faces or view pictures of buildings on campus at MIT where the subjects went to school. She and her colleagues then tried to see if they could determine what the subjects were looking at based on the relative activity in these two parts of cortex. And let's see what they found. So here's just a few trials from one subject's study. And in red, you're going to see the response of the face area. And then the green line will indicate the response of the place area during the same period of time. The subject either looked at faces or places for 16 seconds each. So when the subject was looking at this first face, you can see that there was a spike in activity in the face area. Likewise, for each of the next two, when the subject is looking at faces, there seems to be relatively more activity in the face area. There's also quite a bit of noise in the data, but overall, the pattern is pretty clear. When subjects are seeing faces, there's relatively more activity in the face area, the line in red, and when they're seeing places, there's relatively more activity in this place area, the green line. It's not always clear, for example, this trial here, but overall they were able to determine with about 90% accuracy what subjects were looking at based on the pattern of activity in their visual cortex. You could think of this as kind of a rudimentary brain reading. You're actually able to know something about the contents of a person's mind by looking at the pattern of activity in their brain. In a subsequent study, they took this one step further. In this next study, they had subjects not look at faces and places, but rather imagine them. So they were given a word that indicated a specific famous person or a specific building on campus. And then for 16 seconds, the subject was supposed to imagine that person or that building. And again, they measured activity in the fusiform face area and in the parahippocampal place area. And again, when they were thinking about faces now, not looking at them, but just imagining faces, conjuring them in their mind's eye, the experimenters saw more activity in the fusiform face area. And when the subjects were imagining uh, buildings on campus, the experimenters typically saw more activity in the parahippocampal place area. Again, the experimenters were able to discriminate with about 90% accuracy what the subjects were thinking about the contents of their mind just by looking at the pattern of activity in their visual cortex. Subsequent studies have tried similar things, expanding the number of categories of objects to about a dozen, and also with over 90% accuracy have been able to guess the contents of subjects' mental imagery based on the pattern of activity in visual cortex. It turns out that imagining things generates a similar pattern of activity in the brain as actually seeing them. In fact, a very recent study has been able to read out, to some degree, the contents of subjects' dreams using functional MRI in this way. Okay, now let's talk about motion perception. The perception of motion involves activity in a variety of brain areas that occupy all four lobes of the cortex, but there are a couple of areas that are of central importance. 
One is called area MT. It's in the middle temporal cortex. It's also called V5 because in monkeys it's the fifth visual cortical area. And the analogous area in humans is also known as area MT, and it's in roughly the same part of the brain. Individual cells here respond to stimuli moving in a particular direction. So each cell has a receptive field, a specific part of the visual field that it's sensitive to. But like the simple cells and complex cells we talked about, these are tuned for a particular direction of motion rather than a particular orientation. You can actually read out in monkeys what direction of movement they're seeing just by recording the activity of these individual cells. Again, a kind of rudimentary brain reading. In fact, the professor at UC Davis during his graduate work uh, was able to induce monkeys, was able to sort of trick them into thinking that they're seeing movement in one direction or another by stimulating particular parts of area MT, sort of creating false perceptions by directly stimulating the brain. Cells in the dorsal part of medial superior temporal cortex, or MST for short, respond to expansion, contraction, or rotation of a stimulus, and may be important for helping provide feedback about the movement of your head and body in space. Sometimes visual illusions tell us something about how the brain works, and there's a good one that tells us something about the organization of motion processing in the human visual system. Let me show you this quick demonstration. What I'd like you to do is keep your eyes fixated on the center of this cross. Don't move them. Keep them fixated perfectly still in the center of the cross. Try not to move them at all. Whoa. And you'll notice that, we can do this again, you'll notice that when you stop seeing this contracting stimulus and see if a still picture, it looks like that image is expanding from the middle out. But of course it's not. It's not moving at all. Just like when you stare at a colored image for a while, you can see a negative color after image. When you stare at a particular direction of motion for a while, you can see movement in the opposite direction once that movement stops. Here this inward movement, this uh, contracting movement, becomes an expansion when it stops. And the explanation for this is somewhat similar to the explanation for the negative color after images. In area MT and MST, we have neurons that represent movement in specific directions, in a specific part of the visual field. When those neurons are being activated for a long period of time, they become tired and they tend to be less active when they're no longer being stimulated. As a result, the population of neurons in the chunk of cortex that represents that part of visual space has relatively more activity in the neurons that represent the opposite direction. So you tend to see movement in the opposite direction of the movement that you've been habituated to. If you follow this link in the slides, we'll find another fun example of this. Now, we're going to try this again, but see if it transfers from one eye to the other, okay? So what I'd like you to do is to cover your right eye and just look at the center of that cross with your left eye. Keep looking, keep looking, keep looking, keep looking. But now, when the scene changes, what I'd like you to do is flip back and forth between the two eyes and see if you see the opposite motion with the other eye that was closed. You should find that you do. You should find that this effect transfers from one eye to the other. There is interocular transfer. That tells us something. That tells us that the effect is occurring after the input from the two eyes has been combined. And that happens very early on in visual processing in primary visual cortex and secondary visual cortex, well before most of the input has gotten to area MT and these other motion-sensitive parts of the cortex.